Hello, my name is Nicholas Leonard, and I'm an art and design education doctoral candidate at Northern Illinois University. I believe in the power of art. Specifically, I believe in the power of art to engage our tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is knowledge that resists description, meaning it's hard for us to verbalize or put into words what it is that we know. You may be surprised to find out that all of you already have this superpower of tacit knowledge. For example, you may sense that it is going to rain, but be unable to explain to your friend why you know this to be true. Now, if all knowledge could be conveyed through writing, there would be no need for art. Yet, art still exists. Clearly, there's something special about art's ability to engage our tacit knowledge and have us explore new relations and understandings in the world. Now, I know all that sounds nice, and you're probably thinking, okay, Nicholas, does this really make a difference? Like, does it matter? I'm glad you asked. We know that our use of plastics are harming our oceans. There are an abundance of articles stating this very fact. Yet, it wasn't until society engaged with an image of a turtle with a plastic straw stuck in its nose that we began to see a notable change. For me, this image alone made me question my relationship with nature, plastics, and the ocean in a more nuanced way than any other time in my life. I imagine you probably had a similar tacit knowledge experience, since society dramatically changed its relationship to plastics in the hopes of supporting our ecosystems in the ocean. As an officer for the National Art Education Association's Ecology and Environment Interest Group, I am consistently becoming aware of new environmental issues and statistics that urgently require immediate action. For example, I know that nearly 50% of North America's native bee species are in decline, and nearly one in four is at an increased risk of extinction. But how can I begin to even relate to this information? And what about this knowledge inspires a connection and a hope to enact desperately needed change, to become stewards of the environment? Being an art educator, I wondered, could art help support our pollinators in a similar way that the image of a turtle with a plastic straw stuck in its nose helped change society's relationship to plastics to support our oceans? I was interested in thinking, how could I begin breaking down this pollinator issue? And I broke it down into a knowledge, a connection, and a hope issue. First, we have a knowledge issue. We are still becoming aware of environmental concerns that have been identified by experts. Because these experts are more knowledgeable on a subject, we distance ourselves from it, making claims like, oh, they know more, so they can probably take a better course of action. It's for this reason we have a connection issue. This idea that being stewards of the environment is the responsibility of just a few specialists, rather than all of humanity, which is deeply entangled and embedded in the quality of Earth's ecosystems. Finally, we have a hope issue. As humanity begins to fully recognize the trauma we have and continue to enact on the environment, it can quickly become overwhelming and disheartening. In order for us to embody our roles as stewards of the environment, we need hope to imagine better futures and take action. In another word, we need art. Going back to my earlier comment, our pollinators are in decline. One of the main reasons of this decline is a loss of suitable habitats. Humanity has taken 95% of the natural world and has made it unnatural. Within the lower 48 states, approximately 54% of land use is now a matrix of cities, suburbs, roads, etc. And that remaining 46% is used for various forms of agriculture. These human-made changes in the environment remove the plants that our pollinators depend on. Clearly, if we want to support our pollinators, we need a better way to manage land. But what if I told you that nearly 12% of US land is set aside for various forms of conservation, while a whopping 78% of US land is private property? How does that information change the discussion on managing land to support our pollinators? Thankfully, Dr. Douglas Tamley at the University of Delaware has researched this issue and has been arguing for private landowners to take action. Now, at this point, some of you may be saying, 
I plant flowers, so I'm not really part of this problem. And I very much hope that that is the case. But have you ever wondered, are all flowers created equal? Or stated another way, do all flowers equally support the environment? As it turns out, native plants are immensely better equipped at this task. This is because native plants have evolved within that local climate alongside other living creatures to develop special relationships. In the case of native Midwestern plants, we can see they grow deep roots, requiring less water to survive, and also helping the soil store water. On top of that, native plants require significantly less fertilizers and pesticides to survive. I don't know about you, but I actually kind of felt quite silly. Maybe some of you recognize this image from elementary school, learning that giraffes evolved to get longer necks to eat leaves high up on trees. Well, I don't know about you, but I never fully considered that trees were also evolving to survive as well. Going back to our discussion on native plants, we can see how dramatically different root systems are in comparison to something like Kentucky bluegrass. This is one of the most popular forms of grass used on Michigan front yards. And right now, some of you may be connecting the dots, and the answer is yes. Your nicely mowed front yard is doing virtually nothing to support the environment. As I said earlier, native plants have evolved to develop special relationships with other living creatures. This includes our pollinators. In another study, it was shown that anywhere from 15 to 60% of North America's native bee species are these specialized pollinators and can only collect pollen from approximately 40% of native plants. Thankfully, about 14% of these native plants have been identified as something called a native keystone plant. These keystone plants form the backbones of local ecologies, and a landscape that doesn't have at least one of these keystone plants is doomed to have a failed food web which just crashes the local ecosystem, even if diversity among other plants is very high. Our knowledge issue has now at least in part been addressed. We know that our pollinators are in decline, and a lot of this is due to land management. To best support them, we would need to reintroduce native plants, ideally native keystone plants, to support them. But now we have that connection and hope issue. How can we begin to relate to our environment in a way that inspires action? This is where I saw a connection with the arts through the process of kintsugi. Kintsugi is a Japanese form of art repair for broken pottery pieces that roughly translates into golden joinery. The origin story of kintsugi goes that a 15th century shogun requested that a broken teapot be mended. And the typical repair method at that time essentially equated to, as you see up here, just punching in metal staples. He wasn't very pleased with this overall aesthetic and requested that a new method be made. This is where kintsugi comes into play. Instead of using metal staples, a slow mending occurred using golden lacquer. Rather than trying to conceal the damage done, this highlighted it. And it follows along with the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi, which values brokenness and imperfection. This inspired me, and I started making kintsugi art pieces myself and then introducing it to my students at Northern Illinois University. As I continued making kintsugi pieces, I was also searching up other artists and their use of the kintsugi method. I was very interested in an artwork called Kintsugi Court, which was by Victor Solomon. Here, he used a golden tar to repair a basketball court in southern LA to better support that community. This inspired me. I know that art has power, and I recognize the connection and mending that takes place in the art method of kintsugi. But I was struggling. How could I use the kintsugi method to support our pollinators? Since dumping a golden lacquer on already traumatized ecosystems is clearly not the right answer, I had to get creative. Going back to our discussion on native keystone plants, I started there and started looking for golden flowering plants. It did not take me too long to identify stiff goldenrod, a native keystone plant that supports up to 104 species of caterpillar and 42 bee specialists. I was excited. Not only does stiff goldenrod support so many native pollinators, it also can thrive in inhospitable soils. And this was ideal, since I was able to find a lot of neglected areas in my local ecology. These typically were alongside roads, parking lots, sidewalks, etc. I started planning how I could start planting stiff goldenrod in these traumatized areas of my local ecology, 
but quickly came up against yet another hurdle. Almost all of these spaces are on private property. Going back, this really shouldn't have surprised me because 78% of US land is private property. While the idea of overnight stealth missions planting stiff goldenrods sounded like a good adrenaline rush, I wasn't really too keen on this option. So I did what pretty much anyone else would do. I went online. And it didn't take me long to discover the guerrilla gardening community. Now, before any of you get too excited, guerrilla gardening does not intend to be some form of planting gorillas, which also probably is a crazy adrenaline rush, as well as probably the best pub story of all time. Instead, guerrilla gardening is the name given in the 1970s for the act of gardeners planting on land that they do not have legal right to. Now, while guerrilla gardening started as a title in the 1970s, it was happening long before. Think Johnny Appleseed as one great example. It is also at this point that I want to make a really important, timely statement. Please remember this. Little Nicholas Leonard up here does not have the funds to cover your legal fees should you take up guerrilla gardening as a result of this presentation. So please practice responsible planting. And depending on who you talk to, you didn't hear this from me. As I was saying, I was engaging with the guerrilla gardening community online. And there's a lot of methods, it turns out, to plant on areas that you may not have legal access to or rights to. One of these methods is referred to as seed bombing. Seed bombing is the very simple act of creating a ball out of soil, clay, and seeds to be thrown for planting. This seed bombing approach to guerrilla gardening was ideal for multiple reasons. First off, it is quick. While you're walking, just drop a ball or two and continue on with your way. Secondly, this clay and dirt structure of a ball protects the seed during its early germination phase and also prevents the seeds from being eaten by birds. Finally, a seed ball method also helps in terms of not needing to dig up the soil, tearing into the earth and potentially ruining the soil health and releasing carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. This inspired me. I know that our pollinators need assistance, and I know that art has power. The seed bombing method helped me develop something that I refer to as Kintsugi seed bombing. Kintsugi seed bombing is the act of taking stiff goldenrod seed bombs and finding traumatized areas in your local ecology, and then tossing them to begin a slow golden mending with native pollinating plants in order to support our pollinators. Through this art, I have engaged my tacit knowledge to form new relations and understandings with the environment. I've noticed this mainly in two ways. First off, I am recognized that I am faster to both identify and sympathize with the traumatized areas in my local ecology. Secondly, I also recognize that I have a greater hope. This is because I have a closer connection to both the beauty and resilience of nature. This is inclusive of both the stiff goldenrod, the pollinators, and overall life that begins to thrive around these native keystone plants. As I said at the beginning of this presentation, I believe in the power of art. It is for that exact reason that if all I wanted to accomplish tonight is describe art to you, it would be doomed to fail. I would always fall short. It is for that reason that I want you to engage your art making and engaging with art itself. I want you to engage your tacit knowledge and create new relations and understandings with your local ecology and your local pollinators. In the hopes of developing art to support our pollinators, we addressed both the knowledge, connection, and hope issues associated with it. As a result, I want to leave you with hope to embody your role as a steward of the environment. I want to leave you with art. Thank you very much.